Thank you so much. I'm a little overwhelmed by your kind words. Um, thank you to the Neiman Foundation, to each and every one of the Neiman Fellows, uh, particularly Ravi, Sandra, and also Christian, who helped me figure out what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, I hope all these kind words don't prevent me from someday applying for a Neiman Fellowship, <laughs> because that has always been a dream of mine. Um, I'm particularly honored that you chose to spotlight work done here in the US. I have never faced the challenges that many of the reporters in this room have faced every day uh, abroad. Um, but it's heartening for journalists here at home, like myself, to see that this kind of work, which is very different, is valued too. And I really appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to just quickly th thank a few other people. One is my mother, Marjorie Koloff, who's here tonight, and um, Sarah Jane Lapp, my oldest friend in the world. I would not be here without either of you. Um, and I also wanted to thank my uh, coworkers at Texas Monthly. I feel like every article should have what movies have, where there are these long credits that follow, uh, because it's such a collaborative effort. And whether it's the fact checker, editor, copy editor, designer, photographer, editor, everyone plays a role. And I'm so lucky to work with such amazing people. Uh, and lastly, I want to thank my husband, Chad Nichols, who's not here tonight because he's taking care of our two little ones back in Texas. Uh, none of these stories would exist if not for Chad, who often is taking care of our two little ones when I'm working on them. Uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight was storytelling, not just reporting, um, but storytelling in particular and why it's so important when it comes to public interest stories such as these. Um, writing about these cases involves a tremendous amount of reporting, but the reporting alone isn't enough. And I think sadly a lot of us uh, pick up many public interest stories, I'm using that term broadly, um, and they're, they're important, but they're not necessarily great reads. Um, I find myself skimming a lot of them. I may not remember them the next day. They don't, they don't move me. Um, in Texas, the story is about flaws in the criminal justice system that have had tremendous impact were narrative pieces. Um, and they, they've been written by a number of people, including three colleagues of mine, Michael Hall, Gary Cartwright, and Nate Blakesley at Texas Monthly. These stories had story arcs, well-developed characters, dialogue. They used fictional devices to a certain degree. And I know that Borrowing devices from fiction is nothing new in narrative journalism, but I think many reporters feel, especially when writing public interest stories, that they only need to show their prodigious reporting, or they feel the facts themselves are powerful enough to move the narrative. Um, and I, I feel that more is needed, and, and that is storytelling. Uh, an article that was revelatory for me as far as how I think about storytelling, and it changed the whole way that I write, uh, was a story that appeared in the, New in the New Yorker in 2009 called Trial by Fire by David Graham, which hopefully everybody has read. Um, I've written about it for Neiman Storyboard before. The story is about a man in Texas named Cameron Todd Willingham, who was executed in 2004 after he was convicted of killing his three children by setting their house on fire. Grand showed that the advances in forensic science revealed that almost every assumption we had about the way that fire behaves, assumptions which had been used to convict Willingham were wrong, and that new science actually supported what Willingham's claim had been all along, which is that he'd woken up in a house on fire. It appears that a space heater in the house may have fallen over and ignited some things in the house and that he never intended for his children to die. He was the victim of the house fire as well and the only survivor. The broad facts of this case had been reported before. Gran was not breaking news. The Chicago Tribune had done incredible groundbreaking reporting on this case and many other cases like this. Uh, but in the Willingham case, they had not, it had not gained traction. What Gran was able to do, in part because he was given a lot of room, 16,000 words, was to tell the narrative, not just to examine the recent advances in forensic science, but to tell the story of this one man and his life and what had happened to him. Um, what makes Gran's story work is that it's an incredible narrative piece that stands on its own, regardless of its value as a public interest piece. It was a great narrative first. 
And I think just as with any good short story, there's character development, pacing, drama, nuance. He begins the story by describing the house burning, the way the fire climbs the walls and blisters the ceiling. And it's incredibly powerful. Grand never forgot that he was a storyteller first. When he, toward the end of the story, describes Willingham being strapped down to the gurney before his execution, which he saves to the end of the story, it's extremely painful to read because at that point the reader has come to identify with Willingham and recognize his innocence. And Grand doesn't hide the fact that Willingham was a deeply flawed person. He includes the fact that Willingham beat his wife. He doesn't hide that. But we know at this point, as he's being put on the gurney, that he did not commit this crime. And Grand describes the leather straps that are tightened across his body before this execution is performed. And the horror of that is visceral. This story had tremendous impact. Because of it, there was a reinvestigation of the case. Willingham's execution became an issue in the subsequent governor's race in Texas. It catapulted the case into national news. It helped change the way arson investigations are now conducted in Texas. And it helped launch a re-examination of a number of old arson convictions. So as you can imagine, it was very inspiring to be a reporter in Texas watching all of this happen and to realize the power that this kind of story could have. The lessons I took away from this dovetailed with a lot of thoughts I was already having about narrative journalism and how it's important to be a storyteller first, regardless of whether the story has a public interest component, um, much more than important than statistics or long discussions of public policy, I think is the specificity of one person's story and how that one person's story can have the power to move an entire conversation. To do that, there must be storytelling, character development, story arc, sense of place, so forth. I think storytelling is particularly important right now when our attention is divided between so many different things and reading time is so scarce. Um, I'm always very aware when I'm writing that getting someone to sit down and devote 30 or 45 minutes to reading a story is a lot to ask. And I feel like I have to fight for the reader's attention with, with every sentence. Great storytelling helps to hold the reader's attention. I think it's also critically important to get your readers to connect to the person you're writing about, even if that person is very different than them. When I wrote about Anthony Graves, the man who was formerly on death row, I was very aware that he was very different than our average reader. Our average reader at Texas Monthly is white, affluent, well-educated, lives in the suburbs. Anthony's black, grew up in the projects, dropped out of high school, He'd been arrested for selling drugs and had served time. So I had to find common ground with readers. The story didn't work otherwise. Anthony's attorney, Nicole Caceres, my personal hero, had roomfuls of information on Anthony's case, none of which connected easily or made sense. It was hard to make sense of it all. One of the things that I saw while going through this material was a grainy surveillance video of Anthony's arrest in which a justice of the peace informs him that he's being charged with capital murder. It wasn't much to look at, but if you really listened, the words that were spoken were so powerful. Imagine how you would react if you were approached right now and told that you were being arrested for murdering six people. Anthony was incredulous, confused, angry. At one point he started laughing because it was so preposterous. It was real. It was hard to watch and think that he had really committed this horrendous crime. So I ended the first section of my story on his case with that scene because it put readers in that time and place and it put readers in his shoes. And I think hopefully it helped readers connect with him. Michael Morton, who Robbie spoke about, was much more like our average reader, white, well-educated from the suburbs. He was also a flawed person, and I, taking a, a, a note from Grand's story, showed that in my piece. He was not a great husband. He had done strange things after his wife's murder, like sleeping in the bed where his wife had been bludgeoned to death. I included those details in the story. They made Michael a more vivid, real person, and they established the credibility of the story. He wasn't a saint. <laughs> 
but I also wanted readers to connect with him. And as Robbie pointed out, I felt that the story needed to hinge on his relationship to his son if people were really going to connect with the injustice of what had happened to him. Uh, that beginning of my story uh, began when I first interviewed Michael, and I asked him about his prison visits with his son. And I asked him over and over again, what did they talk about? And sometimes you have to ask a question 5, 10, 15 times, as we've discussed, before you really get there. Um, on one of those times when we were discussing this, Michael mentioned that his son, when he was first incarcerated, was four years old. And he would bring a matchbox car to the prison visits, and he would drive the matchbox car up and down the table in the visiting room. And it, it was a mundane fact, but it told me so much. Um, I think any parent can relate to a moment like that. And I was just so moved by that. And so I asked him for more and more details. And that grew into the first section of the story. My hope was that anyone could connect with that and with his desperate attempt to connect with his son. And that his longing for his son would help to explain the agony of what 25 years in prison really means. What does that mean? Um, to really show what was lost, what had been taken from him. And I also wanted to show that when they were reunited, that the years in prison couldn't be erased. So what I wanted to say in closing is just that I hope we all challenge ourselves, uh, not just to be reporters, but to be storytellers. And I know we're already doing that, but I mean to push ourselves a little bit further, to find those details, those images, those moments that make a story sing. Um, let's push ourselves harder to look for those details. After you've worn out your welcome with a source, which I'm very good at, uh, stay for another hour. Keep asking questions. Ask the question as many times as you need to and find those details that help readers to viscerally connect to the people at the heart of the story. Don't be afraid to try fictional devices because they're not journalistic enough. Sometimes they get at the spirit of the story better. Uh, my most recent story, which I closed yesterday, um, is about a 17-year-old who was an accessory to a murder who was sent to prison for life. And now, 17 years later, the prosecutor's having second thoughts about that sentence and whether life was appropriate for a young man. My story focuses on these two men as they grapple with this. One section of the story is told entirely from the perspective of the 17-year-old, now 34-year-old, uh, about what happened on the night of the crime. It's all in his words. It's about 1,200 words. It's long. Um, it's not something you would do in a regular piece of journalism, but I think, I hope, it's compelling and dramatic. What he tells the reader is as interesting as what he leaves out, and I tell readers what he leaves out later in the story. The story is a public interest story, but it doesn't announce itself as that. There's no long section about juveniles who've been convicted of life sentences or the brain development of juveniles and how it's different from adults. I refer in passing to those things, but there's, it's not a major part of the story. It's a tightly drawn story about two men wrestling with what the right punishment is for a horrendous crime. And I hope it's affecting, and I hope it gets people to sit down for half an hour and read it. Great storytelling engages your audience and I think has a greater impact. I hope we can push ourselves to do things that are a little unusual, creative, and different, and to tell great stories. Thank you so much. Usually I'm alone at my computer, and this is <laughs> overwhelming and in, in the best way. So thank you. So if anyone has questions, Pam will be taking them. Could I, could I um, ask about, um, I noticed uh, uh, the other day there was, there was a, a woman who was executed. Um, a lot of the stories you've told about are people who are innocent. Um, uh, it's more difficult, obviously, to tell a story about somebody who was guilty. In, in Europe, generally, the death penalty 
um, doesn't exist. It's, sometimes it's very hard to deal with uh, the idea that it exists in a country as civilized and as evolved as this. Um, have you ever written stories about about that with a view to, I don't know whether you see yourself as a campaigning journalist as such, but to, to end that in, in this country? Um, Texas has the most active uh, death chamber of any state in, in the country. I believe uh, Texas often executes, depends on the year, but usually more people than all other states combined. So of course it's a very, very big issue where I am. Um, and I, I've written about it a lot. Uh, I wrote a piece years ago that didn't go anywhere. I was dismayed to see about a 17-year-old um, who had committed a terrible crime and who was later executed. And it wasn't about his innocence. It was about whether someone of that age deserved the ultimate punishment. This was before the Supreme Court outlawed the execution of juveniles. Um, so I've written about that in different ways at, at different times. And uh, those stories are always very powerful and have a very, very large audience. I actually have been trying to steer a bit away from them recently because there's so much attention directed to death penalty cases, which are such a tiny, tiny fraction of the uh, problems, I would say, that we have in the criminal justice system in Texas. Uh, there are a lot of people serving sentences for life without parole, um, some, again, that they committed when they were quite young. Um, and those cases where they, they are not entitled to a, a much lengthier appeals process as death row inmates are, I think is a more neglected area. Um, I'm becoming more interested in writing about juveniles. I'd love to write a story. It's not, it, it, would, it would be a tough sell, but uh, about the plea bargaining uh, that so many indigent people have to do because they simply do not have the options to take a case to trial. So I think those death penalty um, stories are very important and I have written them and will continue to write them, but I hope that, um, that looking at other cases is done as well and doing what we call um, mitigation narratives where you talk about what was this inmate's background? How did he come to this point where he was able to commit this terrible crime? Um, I have started to interest me a bit more. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Would you talk a bit about your technique for writing storytelling stories? I mean, you start with a lead, you start with, with a structure of quotes, do you start with scenes, do you do it chronologically? How do you do it? It's a great question. I wish that I had a, the magic answer as to how they come together. It seems to be different with every piece. Um, I find that I always know how each story ends. I always know the last line of my story when I start writing. And my job is to figure out how on earth to get from the beginning to that point. Um, I've tried outlining. I've tried not outlining. Uh, I've tried outlining and then throwing out the outline. Um, it seems to change with every single story. But I do. Um, really like having an image that I start with, like I said about the matchbox cars, of really starting with, with something simple that is symbolic and making sure that that's gotten across in the, in the very first section. Uh, but I wrestle with that one every time. Writing, I love reporting, I hate writing. <laughs> yes? I think I know where you're headed, but what do you mean by using fictional devices? Um, I talk about this a lot with writers who pitch to Texas Monthly who have terrific story ideas, but the stories they're pitching are um, subjects more than they are stories. And that a story I consider to have a real narrative arc, um, character development, um, three-dimensional depictions of, of everything, that it, it could be like a piece of fiction. Of course, every sentence has to be fact-checked, so you can't get too creative. But um, I think so just... the emphasis on device, but not on fiction. I, I guess that's the better way of putting it. And in the last story that I wrote, except for that very long passage that I mentioned that was entirely in the words of this um, juvenile, I, I tried not to use quotes. I tried to... 
have a, a more omniscient uh, author authorial voice. Um, things like that, things that are a bit different than what you might see in your average newspaper story, if that makes sense. I'm curious what you think about, you've, you've written these wonderful stories that are about very specific cases that have very specific characters, and yet nonetheless, uh, it seems that, that you're trying to get at, and Texas journalism needs to get at, much more syst systemic issues about mm -hmm. the criminal justice system, and you know, your characters are exemplars of some of those trends, but they are much deeper trends, and since you were talking about storytelling, the power of the individual, I'm curious how, you, and also your what your comment about maybe thinking that death penalty cases may not be as representative as, as some of the other things you might tell. I'm just curious how you think about focusing on the individual cases and the power of that versus maybe the broader picture that might come from mm -hmm. focusing on issues that go beyond one or two individual cases. Sure. Um, what I've seen over and over again is that the broader cases, at least where I am, the, the, the broader stories where you might talk about four or five different examples and you have some policy you know, and, and uh, legislative stuff in the mix, th they just don't go anywhere. And that, um, for example, the story I just wrote that I was talking about, um, this 17-year-old was convicted because of something called the law of parties. The law of parties in Texas erases the distinction between the killer and the accomplices. So you're all considered, if you're at the wheel of the getaway car, you're just as guilty as the guy inside the convenience store who just shot someone in the head. Um, as you can imagine, that's problematic, especially when you're talking about death penalty cases. So I could have written an entire story about the law of parties. I could have used all that legal language. I could have come up with four or five different examples of people who have been convicted using this law. Um, but I, I, it's my own personal bias that it's that one really specific story that's going to get people to read to the end and that they're going to remember and that will really help them understand that issue more deeply. Not always, but I think generally that, that seems to work better, at least for me. Talk this week. You mentioned that you are this part of this lucky group of reporters that witnessing witnesses uh, witnesses these changes in the these dramatic changes in the justice system in, in Texas due to the DNA law, tests, etc. Can you tell us about what this means for the for the broader picture of this? There have been incredible strides in Texas in the past really eight years. And I know that may sound strange being outside of Texas because, of course, there are a very high number of executions. But um, I, I should have brought the statistics. But just as an example, uh, nine, nine people were executed in Texas last year as opposed to 40 in the year 2000. Um, I believe it was eight people were were given death sentences last year as opposed to around 45 from that same time period. So there, there is a huge shift happening. I think a lot of that has to do with these DNA exonerations and the idea that it can be scientifically shown that an innocent person um, was convicted of something that he or she didn't do, and it's not just crazy liberal journalists saying so. Um, there have also been a lot of legislative reforms because of some of the cases that we've talked about. Um, some pretty amazing stuff. In, in some ways, Texas has become very progressive, which may be surprising to some people. Um, we, through legislative re reforms in the past uh, four years, uh, things have changed dramatically as far as um, the way that police lineups are conducted has totally changed. Uh, uh, district attorneys can no longer deny requests for post-conviction DNA testing. The statute of limitations on prosecutorial misconduct has been extended, um, and on and on and on. I could give you a long list of, of reforms. And I think those are really, really significant things. And the people who lobbied for them are some of the people we talked about, Anthony Graves and Michael Morton went to the legislature and spoke directly with legislators who were aware of their stories because of our coverage. And um, so 
things are happening and are changing, and it's slow, but um, it's, it's good to see that change is happening. Yes. It's been my experience that um, people don't like to admit they made a mistake, mm -hmm. other than what the gentleman said in the opening mm -hmm. remark, and that, um, um, <clears throat> particularly in death cases, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm curious to know two things. First of all, the kind of reaction you got from the law enforcement community with your cases. <clears throat> and secondly, the overall reaction of this community to the changes that you've just talked about. Mm -hmm. Because my sense is that I don't think they're happy about that. They're no. not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, which really comes as a shock to me. I, I, it's still very hard for me to understand why you don't want to get the right guy who's just committed a horrible crime. I, I, you know, we talk a lot about tunnel vision and people's belief. I, I, I do think sometimes people are framed, but I, I believe the overwhelming number of times that both prosecutors and police officers in cases like this, there are many, many good cases, but in cases like this suffer from tunnel vision. And um, they certainly don't like reporters and legislators telling them how to do their jobs. So that, um, that has not been greeted very positively. Uh, what's interesting to me is um, Dallas has been the most progressive on this issue. Um, Dallas has a shameful and long history of, of wrongful convictions, especially with African-American men. And uh, in 2006, Dallas elected a new DA, the first African-American DA, Craig Watkins, and he devoted tremendous resources to going back and looking at troubling cases. And in those eight years, there have been uh, 26 exonerations in Dallas County because of the DA's office, which is incredible. Um, what's sad is that Craig Watkins is an outlier. I, I think we all thought that Houston, San Antonio, Austin, um, that the DA's offices there would launch similar investigations, and that has not happened so far. Do you find that the prosecutors think they're still guilty after they've been proved innocent? Yes. <laughs> in, uh, in the case of Anthony Graves, the man who was on death row, um, I recently wrote a story asking why the prosecutor in his case had never been disciplined by the bar. He still has his law license. He was found by a federal court to have suborned perjured testimony, to have withheld exculpatory evidence, and the bar did nothing. Um, and uh, that got a conversation going, and now some things are happening. And uh, the prosecutor's response to that was to personally drop in and visit several newsrooms in the area where he is, and to say that not only had he done nothing wrong, but Anthony was a murderer who should not be out in the free world. So it's really disheartening to see that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as a non-Texan, there must be days or weeks or years that you feel like a foreign correspondent. Uh, <laughs> I was going to make such a joke. <laughs> I just wonder what, what, if you could say a little bit about what it means to you to sort of have adopted <clears throat> this cause mm -hmm. um, as your own, um, and also if you bump up against sort of uh, cultural or issues where people look at you as an outside rabble rouser, mm -hmm. describing a situation you don't understand. That happened when I first moved there, and a question I got a lot was, now where are you from? Yeah. Um, I don't get that anymore. Uh, in part, Texas has changed so dramatically since I moved there 20 years ago. I live in Austin, and it's rare to meet someone who actually grew up there. It's just a very, very cosmopolitan place now. Um, so I think I think there is some of that. I do get the occasional Yankee comment from from readers, but um, a lot less of it than than you would think. And I think what's interesting is the public is very receptive to these stories. It's it's really it's the the prosecutors and uh, in some cases law enforcement who are resistant, it's not the public. And just as an example, what's been interesting to me is, you know, we've had a great rise in Texas of the Tea Party. We have a Tea Party senator who you may be familiar with. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the Tea Party sort of meets liberals, if you follow them 
all the way around when it comes to personal liberty. And so issues like wrongful convictions resonate with both of those groups. And um, even Governor Perry has signed some really important legislation um, into law, some of the things I mentioned before. So I think the public is, is open to this. I don't think they were before all of these um, DNA exonerations. And the Dallas County DNA exonerations I was talking about, I mean, you would pick up the newspaper almost every week for a while and see some guy walking out of prison on the front page of the newspaper. That's, that's pretty powerful stuff. Yes? Can you talk a little bit more about how and why you gravitated to this subject? And just as a follow-up, do you ever just get tired? <laughs> I'm uh, trying to branch out a little bit more. I don't want to write the same story over and over again, though there is a story in East Texas right now along these lines that I very much want to cover. Um, but to me, uh, Sandra and I talked about this a bit because we write, well, we write about different things, but we both write about crime. To me, crime stories in general are so fascinating because um, you see people put into the most extreme position they could ever be put into, and they're, they're tested in unusual ways. And um, I, I'm never ceased to be amazed by how one event 20 or 30 years ago shatters so many lives and, and affects so many people, hundreds of people along the way. Um, I think narratively that's very interesting to me. So apart from any social justice purpose, I think narratively it's fascinating. Um, something that had a huge impact on me was a documentary that my mother took me to uh, in the 80s, The Thin Blue Line. If you haven't seen it, go see it immediately, uh, about a wrongful conviction case out of Dallas County. And it was just um, a life-changing, I was a teenager when I saw it, but it was sort of a life-changing um, experience to see that movie. And, you know, I grew up upper middle class white girl believing that police were trying to do the right thing. And that was a interesting moment to watch that movie and see that maybe that wasn't always the case. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about your relationship with the people that you are reporting on, kind of how you manage that relationship both during the reporting uh, and in the aftermath if you still have relationships with people? I always feel a little bad for the people I write about because they have no idea what they're getting into when they agree to let me into their lives. Um, the amount of time that I'm going to be asking of them, the attention in some cases that they'll get, um, the extremely personal nature of the questions that I ask over and over again. So I try to give a sense of that up front as much as I can because um, I want to make sure someone's going to see me through the process. Um, and I try to be frank with them about what's going to be in the piece that they may not like. Um, in the Michael Morton story, I talked about how he was not a great husband, for example, and that was really hard for him. He, the story had been covered widely in, the, in newspapers in Texas, and he was understandably depicted as this saint-like person who had suffered for 25 years and gotten out. But I wanted to depict the real complex person that he was at the time that this crime happened. So we went back and forth about that and um, I think came to an agreement about it. But it's, that's a difficult one to negotiate. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Thank you so much, y'all.